Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. I'm Dr. Greer, and I'd like to thank everyone at the World Puja Network for hosting us here every two weeks to bring you updates on what we're doing with the Disclosure Project and CSETI and uh, the film Sirius and all the exciting projects that are going on this year with us. And uh, I'm really excited about today's show. We have a a wonderful person who's uh, got her own radio show that all of you need to tune into on a regular basis, uh, Hilary Ramo. And uh, we'll be getting to her in a moment. She's a a brilliant person and a very pure-hearted person who's been supporting our work for several years. Um, One thing I wanted to announce is that um, I'm going to be uh, having a a, a appearing at the premiere of Sirius in Las Vegas um, on Saturday, the 20th of July. So those of you who are in the um, desert southwest who want who want to come is actually going to be at the JW Marriott at the ballroom. It's during the MUFON conference there, and there's a link from our site, seriousdisclosure.com, um, if you want to find out about that. And um, so I'll be there uh, speaking uh, before the the film, and then we'll have the, the full. Uh, serious film shown in Las Vegas, so you can find out more about that at SeriousDisclosure.com. And also, we're going to do a one-day uh, under the stars out in Joshua Tree, right on the edge of Joshua Tree National Park, which is very beautiful. It's where we've had some of the most amazing and spiritual contact we've ever had, uh, and that's going to be during the Contact in the Desert event uh, in Joshua Tree, California, which is, of course, the high desert of California um, in in Southern California, uh, but uh, sort of east of Palm Springs. And there's a conference there. I'm speaking on uh, a Sunday, the 11th, and then that night of August, this is August 11th, and then that night, uh, for those of people who want to stay around after the conference wraps up, um, I'll be presenting from 4 to 6 in the afternoon on August 11th. Um, and then that night, for those of people who want to stay around, we're going to do a mass a meditation and puja and met, uh, contact out in the desert on about 450 acres of land that's adjacent to this beautiful retreat center uh, that's on the edge of Joshua Tree National Park. And uh, that will be going on from 8.30 at night until about 12.30 or 1 in the morning. And information about that is also at Serious Disclosure. Dot com. So those of you who want to join me out there under the stars, it's going to be a, a, an interesting event because it may be one of the largest mass CE5 meditation events that's, that we've ever done. And it's really exciting just because of the, the power that has in consciousness. And also it's uh, just beautiful night sky there because you know, you're out in a wilderness area on a lot of land and it's the stars are so brilliant because you're up high and it's very dry air so it's it's just a wonderful experience for those of you who are in california or the southwest um, i look forward to seeing you at that event and then um, you want may want to stay tuned we may be having a serious film uh, event in london uh, it looks like we will be having it where the um, british academy of film the bafta um, theater in Piccadilly in London. So that looks like that's going to happen. So you may want to get on our email list for uh, that. It's, it's a fairly small theater in London. It's in Piccadilly. Um, but uh, it looks like we're going to firm that up so that uh, we'll be having a premiere for Sirius in London. Well, basically, BAFTA is like their Academy um, Awards entity for Britain, and uh, they're hosting us there. So uh, that's also uh, occurring. And also stay tuned. We're, we're hoping to have an uh, Australian series premiere and uh, later in August of this year. Um, I've been invited to meet with uh, about 120 world leaders in Australia. Um, and while I'm there, we're planning to do a serious uh, premiere probably in the Brisbane area. This is still being planned, um, but if you get on our email list, you can sign up for free to get our newsletters at SeriousDisclosure.com. We'll keep you apprised if you're down under and uh, in that area of the world because what we're hoping to do is at least have a serious premiere and possibly – uh, a couple day workshop out under the stars in a beautiful resort somewhere near Brisbane, Australia. So all those things are up and coming in the next six weeks or so. So just stay tuned, and uh, 
if you can join us, uh, we'd love to see you. So with those notes aside, I just wanted to thank uh, you, Hillary uh, Ramo, for appearing as she's uh, here to talk about uh, the really the spiritual and consciousness dimension of making contact. Uh, Hillary is a, uh, a Reiki master and hosts her own show, as I mentioned. She's very conscious and uh, telepathic and has worked in uh, many areas uh, doing spiritual work of this type. And she's actually been on an expedition with us under the stars. So, Hillary, thank you for being here. Hi, Stephen. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. So I'd like to, you know, can you share with folks sort of how you uh, kind of experience uh, the concept of consciousness and its spiritual dimension? I I would think it would be great for folks to hear it from your perspective since you're so experienced in that area. Sure. Well, you know, my my experience started when I was a young girl. My grandfather was a psychic, and, you know, he worked a lot way before the Internet ages here, so he was really working in a lot of circles um, before we could really Google somebody. (laughs) And, uh, you know, he did – he taught me meditation when I was about four or five years old, Mm. and it was quite an extraordinary experience. Uh, Of course, at the time, you know, as a little girl, it it didn't really – you know, mean much until I got older and really realized what he was doing. But, you know, I did my first past life regression with him when I was five years old. So the out-of-body experience for me personally became very familiar to me at a very young age. And he was, he worked a lot in that arena. He was very um, interested in it. He did a lot of research in it. He spent a lot of time working with other psychics in that area, too. So I was kind of, you know, the little following following him around, you know, kind of interested in what he was doing. He was actually working with biofeedback machines at oh. that time when I was that young. Um, so it was interesting. He would hook me up to them, and I would kind of watch how, you know, something on my finger would be measuring my pulse, and it would be making a click to my heartbeat, and then how my breathing techniques would lower that. And so I was quite fascinated with that as a child. And so we would go on what he would call journeys, and we would go out, and we would have these experiences. Experiences and I would meet my guides and certain things and so it was quite it was quite unique. Obviously, most four or five year old American children aren't doing that. <laughs> I would say not. Yeah. yeah. So you know, over the course of time, that just kind of led into a, a variety of other things. And as I got older, I studied psychology formally, and uh, it just didn't quite cut it because I had ex- been exposed to a lot of these different spiritual elements over time. And um, so I began to branch out and, you know, kind of explore different things, shamanistic uh, teachings. I work with the indigenous, as you know. Um, right. I, I work with the Cuero Apache in New Mexico specifically at this point in my life. And uh, so I've been I've been involved and exposed to a lot of different cultures, and I've always been very interested in religion, all, only from a sense of studying the symbolism and going into the different teachings. So I have uh, minored that in college and explored a lot of the different um, religions and backgrounds. And what I found, which has always been very intriguing to me, was that there's like always a common story theme that goes through all of them. And so right. it's not so much about, you know, which one is this or which one is that, but it's about looking at the bigger picture. And so consciousness evolved out of that for me in, in my path along the line. There was just basically seeing, well, this is really more about the evolution of mind and heart and, and being able to come out of the body and experience different realms of, of experience, different dimensions, and, and going into these kinds of places consciously, lucidly, with intention and with will. And so it was it was just a natural evolution of sorts over the course of time that's led me to where I am, which led me to Reiki and led me to other alternative healing techniques. And uh, it, so it's been a compilation of different modalities for me over time and and I'm just very fortunate to have met so many wonderful people across the way that have been able to assist me on that. Wonderful. What a great uh what a great journey. Yeah, I I didn't have any formal introduction, but when I was very young began to have these sort of consciousness experiences and uh and lucid dreams. I I don't know, I think it may be the fact that I'm part Cherokee and there's a strong um, tradition of lucid dreaming and precognition in, in the Ch- Cherokee tradition, and um, so from a very young age, I would have uh, very full color lucid flying dreams, and it and I would see things that would happen the next day or a year from then. Uh, I actually met my wife that way, as people who've read my book Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge know, and uh, before I met her physically, and and I think what's interesting is that. Uh, you know, I was raised. Uh, I did not have your advantage. My background was that 
my family were very um, scientific and humanistic, and if you couldn't put it in a test tube, it didn't exist. And <laughs> if you couldn't if you couldn't hook up a, a scientific device to it and measure it, it didn't exist. So um, I was raised in a tradition where I was taught that um, you know we have a physical dimension. You're born, you live, you die. That's the end of it. And uh, of course, uh, when I was 17, I had a near-death experience and actually went into this state of higher consciousness and uh, unity consciousness, uh, m profound experience, where I realized that, mm, well, what I was really told isn't true, and uh, there is, in fact, uh, this vast cosmos that's folded within the conscious structure of every one of us, and it was really clear. Now, of course, at age 17, I didn't have a foundation for, for understanding it intellectually, but I had a foundation and experience at that point that was amazing. And that sort of was was my introduction to it. It's interesting, though, because about a couple years before that, I started experimenting with just techniques of meditation I invented on my own, where I would be um, lying out in a meadow outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, where I grew up, and I would bicycle out to the country because I loved wilderness and I loved uh, nature. And I would do these meditation techniques that I just sort of visualized on my own. And I would have these out-of-body experiences where I would float over the city and would see things. And uh, I began to do this kind of traveling and remote viewing even before my near-death experience. And it was really crystal clear. And um, uh, so... You know, I, I began to really question what I had been taught. Um, and, you know, some people were raised in religious traditions that are very rigid. I was raised in a scientific tradition that was equally rigid. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it was it was interesting that the path that I took was, was one that where I discovered this very much on my own from some inner spiritual knowledge that was latent. And... Um, What's exciting about it is that that's why, as I've begun to teach the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind protocols to people, many people say, oh, well, I wasn't raised in a family that did this, and I don't have any. I said, yeah, but I wasn't either. And I, what, I, what I point out to everyone is that if you're conscious, you can be aware of awareness. And if you can become aware of pure, quiet mind in a deep, deep state, you can then escape the boundaries of linear 3D space and 4D space time and see distant places and travel to other star systems and see other dimensions and learn knowledge from the level of Ritambara Pragya, which is the Sanskrit term, the Vedic term for this level of consciousness where all knowledge is contained. And this is such an exciting a bit of information for people because most people think that you have to lay around on a bale of net, a, a, a nail of beds, a, a bed of nails, excuse me, for you know like 40 years and then you know come out of a cave as a grizzled old man. Before you, ha I said no. I mean, this is something that is the birthright of every single person on the planet, and importantly, and we can talk about our subject of ETs and and other dimensions of all the interstellar civilizations, that every sentient being in the cosmos has what's common with us is the universality of mind and consciousness. And when you realize that that is the foundation, it really is uh, the spiritual foundation for everything we're doing with the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind initiative to make contact, is that it's the realization that the light of consciousness, the mind itself, is a singularity, as Irvin Schrodinger, the, the father of modern quantum physics, said, and, and that the, the conscious mind itself uh, is a trans, den, transcendental and transpersonal uh, and is a singularity, that the mind whereby every single person is awake is, in fact, one and there's never separation. And the native peoples really understand this concept of shall we use the term uh, divine unity or profound oneness um, so well. And one of the things I remember reading many years ago is the Native peoples and many uh, in South America and North America were kind of appalled at Western um, civilization was, was the concept of separateness and, and that it, we're so separate and everything is separated, when in reality we never are. And in many of these uh, more ancient cultures, that was just a way of living, like the dream time of the... Um, aboriginals of australia 
where it was just part of their life that they would go into the dream state and they would converse with people in remote locations and they would have precognition during the dream. And this was just part of the culture. It was part of their reality and was experienced in a very common way, not just by you know shamans and what have you, but by everyone. And I think that this is what's exciting. I think in the in the coming era that we're entering into, this is going to be the central science and the central area of study is the study of consciousness and higher states of consciousness. Well, I agree. And, and one of the projects I'm working on right now with Maria Yesperu, she's a Quero Apache elder. She and I are writing a book together that will be released later this year, and she's actually coming out for the first time releasing some of these star being prophecies specifically for this time period. And what I'm doing is I'm taking those prophecies as the co-author of the book and clairvoyantly kind of looking into it and, and translating it into a modern-day um, message or so that everybody can relate to. Um, I think one of the things that is important, and also another, another thing that they do talk about, and uh, especially more and more recently, is that you know, they call this the fifth world, that we've really moved from the fourth world into the fifth world. And the fifth world holds the secrets of how the body, the human body itself, is the time machine. Uh, it is the, the vehicle for higher dimensional travel, for going to star systems, just like you say. And, you know, they talk about that and they release and they, you know, the, the indigenous for a long time didn't really want to talk about these kinds of subjects. They were very right. quiet about it. They were very secretive. Um, and now, you know, across the board with the Hopi, with a lot of the different um, cultures and tribes, they really are opening up and letting this information come out because all of the signs have happened and all of the things that, you know, clue them off, the synchronicities, all of the things that happen that, you know, that show them that it is time have, have been happening. So this is a wonderful thing. And, you know, when these kinds of things are released into the mass awareness in, in way, you know, by a book or an article or, you know, one of them does a radio show and people listen, it, it 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 does. It gets into consciousness and, and it spreads and it just kind of opens people up. And and you know they were waiting for humanity to be ready for this in a sense of you know not wanting to take the information and manipulate it or or use it for greedy purposes or to go out and twist it and, and turn you know turn it around into something that it's not meant to be. So it's wonderful that this has happened and we're watching a lot of the elders come forward and and talk about the star prophecies and you know the Pleiades is a very very important star system to to the people that I work with, and so I work a lot with that energy. So when I go out and I you know look up at the sky at night by myself, and I'm sitting out on my deck and and uh, meditating, that's one of the star systems that I'll look for specifically and actively, intentionally, consciously uh, connect with. You know, you have you have things like the Giza pyramids that correlate with Orion. You know, we've had people come Correct. out and. And you know the serious star system and all of these other things and and uh, you know you have to you have to kind of wonder and I do sometimes if when these things come out how people's consciousness is affected directly by the correlation to the specific star system so you have this wonderful movie by the way that you know called Sirius so it brings people's attention to that star system and I believe that there is a consciousness that's associated with each of these specific star systems and so as we spend time contemplating on them or consciously connecting to them, whether it's in, in whatever way, shape, or form we choose. We end up having our own experiences, unique and individual. And when you were talking earlier about your own growing up experience and how you really were asked to develop these techniques on your own in, your, in a natural way, you know, kind of, kind of like an alchemical way, really, Stephen, because you had all of this friction and heat and things going on around you that, that may have You've been perceived at the time as unsupportive in that, but yet they were causing that. So it's a really beautiful way to come out and to be able to uh, express your consciousness in the world. And a lot of people are, are experiencing that same thing. So to those listening, you know, I really suggest, you know, that you read his books, you, you read Stephen's books, you, you try to really – uh, attend the events if you can. I mean, I, I've been to your expedition before, and I have read all your books, um, and I've done several, you know a couple shows with you on my own radio show. So I've had a chance to interact with you and to be a part of the group and to see what happens, and something really magical does happen. And I don't care what anybody says. I mean, you have to go by your own experience. If you're sitting there and you have something happen, you really can't do anything except acknowledge it. Because right. 
you've seen it. I've seen the orbs float through the field when we're sitting in a circle with 50 of us. Right. Um, we've all seen the same color. You would point something out, and I saw it. A lot of other, some other people saw it too. Um, there really is no, no denying the fact that when a group of people get together and they consciously choose to, to uh, tune in to a higher level of mind, to leave fear behind, and to choose to plug into love, to heart, to whatever you want to call it. I call it love. I call it heart. And, um, you know, magic happens, and it creates an atmosphere. It changes it changes the atmosphere around you. It allows things in. Um, you know, I've been in the same kind of situations out in ceremony, private ceremony with some very powerful people, you know, um, indigenous people who this is what they do in their lifetime. This is, this is the energy they connect to. Things have shown up just because we're act- actively tapping into the consciousness, the level, the frequency, whatever you want to call it, and the, the life forms that exist in other dimensional realities that we cannot see with just our everyday, ordinary eyes, um, they feel it. They call, you know, they're, they're, we kind of call them in and they show Absolutely. up and they are there. And that's what's really beautiful about it. And this is what, what I believe is so important with the contact experience and so few UFO ET researchers really do this. There are some great ones out there that do. You are certainly one of them. Um, but the higher level of consciousness, this, this going into this self-propelled, individualized uh, body mechanism sort of experience where you really just turn yourself on and then you plug into the group or you plug into another person, profound things happen. And it's documented, and people can, can attest to that simply by being there firsthand. You may read something that I write on my blog, The In Factor. You know, people can go to my website, HillaryRamo.com, and they can find my blog. I mean, that's pretty much where I express a lot of things that come through as a clairvoyant. And when you read it, it may not mean anything to you, but at the time that I'm writing it, it's something powerful is coming through me, and it's just being expressed through words. Some people pick up paints and paint a picture or, you know, do some other creative outlet. For me, it happens to be a kind of poetic expression. So it comes out in this sense for me, but, you know, that's just, that's just a side effect of the actual experience. One of the things that I think is so important also at this time is is really learning how to connect with other people in this state of mind. Um, I, I've been a big advocate, especially for men and women, to connect on this, you know, have the male and female energies and, and to just, you know, that, that spark of creation. You know, men and women create life. And whether that's a physical life or um, a spark of spiritual flame, that divinity, that, that kind of, uh, alchemical reaction, the union of the two. There's amazing things that can happen, and I really hope that people start researching and going into more of an intuitive look, if you will, into what this is going, what, what this phenomena is, because you really can't dissect it into a scientific study. Although you can really find some chemical reactions, some kind of physical reactions that do happen in the body. I was reading this study the other day, where they had. Uh, couples line up in front of each other, and then they switched. You know, they kind of had right. your different partners go in front of the other person. And somehow they were able to monitor the body's reactions, and when their own partners were sitting in front of them, the, the love bond, the connection, the familiarity with each other was able to change the chemical reactions inside of the body. So you have, you have these, these, and then, you know, the article ends with, oh, maybe it means something. Well, you think? <laughs> I think we really have evolved to the point where, these kinds of things really need to be started to, to be looked at in a little bit more depth so that we can finally, that critical mass tipping point where consciousness becomes, you know, this kind of consciousness becomes the majority, and we can change the world this way. We can change our neighborhoods, our states, our countries, our political systems. You know, we can change how we deal with the planet, the sustainability issues that we have, the climate issues that we have. The, you know, we watch the world now as we have these big, displays of power going on with whistleblowers hiding in other countries and all of these things coming to the surface. Well, right. When right. people say to me, well, that's not a very spiritual topic, and why are you talking about that, and why are you, you shouldn't focus that, that's negative. And this is exactly what I say to them. I say, well, you know, I look at it like, you know, we all have a shadow. And in any healing process, you go through the process of navigating through your shadow, those qualities of self that need healing, that need to be looked at. It's the dark night of the soul, whatever you want to call it. Well, 
the microcosm and the macrocosm are not separated. So whatever's going on with you and your own healing experience, you can always look at the collective platform and say, well, how, how is this healing? Well, the collective platform is going through a healing process, and there are no more secrets. And things are coming to the surface to be healed, to be transformed, and we're seeing where these weaknesses lie. And we have a choice. We can go ahead and, you know, just ignore it and continue on our way. Uh, let it be somebody else's problem and, uh, you know, just focus on whatever it is that has our attention for the day. Or we can actually say, wow, you know, this is very telling, this is very inspiring. You know, we are watching these kinds of things happen and, uh, you know, what's our own inner whistleblower doing? You know, where are the truths inside of us that need to come to the surface? And how do we deal with those truths when when they come to our own surface? Do we hunt them down and slay them as fast as we can, shove them underneath the couch so nobody can see them? Or do we really take the time to take a look at it and see where we can reorganize and restructure some of our basic foundational principles within our own lives. And that would include being more connected to the earth. That would be include that would include being more conscious of the energy forms that we use, oil, you know, that kind of stuff. So when you talk about on large levels to people about this topic, you know, we need new energy. We need it to come in now. We need it to be able to you know, balance out the, the energy, the earth energy. Well, people are often connect, disconnected from that because they don't know how to act. They don't know how to change anything. And, uh, you know, really, you really have to bring these kinds of things home and you really have to apply them to yourself, the microcosm of the macrocosm. Everything that you want to change in the world lies within you. Well, and actually, the the world is a is a manifestation of the inner reality. In other words, uh, on, even on the level of if you look at Rupert Sheldrake's work in morphogenic fields, that as people begin to do something, whatever it is, a, a skill that's learned, it's the hundredth monkey effect. Non locally in remote places, people who have no connection to those uh, to that person in terms of a linear connection will begin to have the same ideas or to have a similar pattern of thought or behavior. And this has been studied also with large groups of people meditating and praying where it has an effect on an entire population of people. And so the it, it's not as if our own internal existence is separate from the external. This, this duality is actually maya. That's the illusion. It, it, the reality is, is that the entirety of the cosmos and the entire universe, even the external universe, is folded within this architecture and structure of the conscious mind that is within every individual. And that means that every individual is a conscious quantum hologram. Uh, so if, if you understand what a hologram is, if you take a, a hologram of say, Marilyn Monroe with her skirt blowing up. I mean, it's just a graphic image. Everyone knows what it is. And and you, you if you were to take a little teeny part of that hologram, say, the edge of her skirt, you would be able to go in it and you would have the entirety of Marilyn Monroe, that whole image, and it's within, 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 within. Well, the whole universe is a conscious quantum right. hologram. Yeah. And each individual that is a conscious being, which is all of us, has the entirety of the cosmos folded within us. And that's why when individuals go into deep meditation to make peaceful contact with these other civilizations from other star systems, it has an enormous effect way beyond what people can realize. And um, for people who are hearing this for the first time, well, on our website there's a link to uh, a contact app that you can put on your iPhone or, or smartphone. And we now have thousands of people who are doing this, and there's a meditation uh, in there. there. All the protocols are in this app. It has. It will turn your phone into a magnetometer that will will pick up the changes in the magnetic field as other life forms or ET craft approach. It is an amazing app, actually, and it's there. And what's what we're finding is that people who will take this app and uh, just use it. I mean, people who are just you know everyday ordinary people. All over the world, we're getting these reports of amazing contact they're having. Why? Because the universality of consciousness is that it's universal, and and the mind that is within each of us is a singularity. And when you practice these deep meditation protocols and then intend to make peaceful contact, there is a hunger, an eagerness. 
by these interstellar civilizations that have been around since the beginning of time, who have been around, some of them, I call them the guardians of life on Earth, who have been around watching and seeing the Earth develop and protecting the Earth. They are so eager for humans to awaken to that capability that that is why they will appear. Uh, and, of course, some people have experiences with purely spiritual beings that aren't 3D physical, but, but I'm now referring to extraterrestrial civilizations that have physical worlds, physical bodies, and physical spacecraft. But in order to travel through interstellar distances, they use technologies and consciousness to drop out of 3D and to go through other dimensions, much like a lucid flying dream. And this is why... So many people have experiences in the meditative and sleep state with ETs. And if you learn how to do the meditation and do the remote viewing, it will open that up uh, because interstellar civilizations, uh, the ones that have developed even a few thousand years past where we are, they routinely have that capability that interfaces not just with their consciousness but also with their technologies. And I've called this consciousness-assisted technology, but they also have technology-assisted consciousness where a technological system assists in the consciousness and the projection of consciousness or even the so-called astral body of light, um, which is if you go to our website, you'll see a picture on the CE five part of, of SeriousDisclosure.com, you'll see a picture of this being floating in the desert um, outside our circle in Joshua Tree a couple years ago. And and his name is Bijou, and he's from Andromeda Galaxy. And it's an amazing photograph. And it was first seen, just what you were talking about a moment ago, as an orb. It was about the size of a grapefruit, a sphere, floating in the desert during one of our breaks. And then as we, I was down in the desert away from the group with just maybe five or ten people, and I came and saw this, and several people saw it, and it floated beside my right shoulder for just a short distance and vanished. And then I went back to the whole group, and I said, oh, God, we have to get back together. But everybody was talking, and it was at a break where people were getting you know something to drink and eat. And... One of our team members, Raven, um, then heard along with myself and several other people a whole little group of extraterrestrial biological life forms talking. I mean, literally, you could hear them like da 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 da. <laughs> and most people heard females, but I heard also a male voice in there. And I said, No, there's four of them, and one of them's a male. And so Raven uh, connected with her mind her consciousness and asked permission to take their photograph even though they were dematerialized but you could hear them talking now this gets into the whole question of transdimensional scientists science and how ETs can appear disappear appear partially in this dimension partially not it's a fascinating area of study which is really what the main focus that I'm trying to bring to people is so they understand there's a whole science to this but there's there's an experiential level of it um, and that you really have to master to understand what's going on when you make contact. But it, at that moment, she just asked permission and took a photograph, and I think she had it set so the lens was open three or four seconds. And in the, in the frame was this male that had, was floating just outside where our chairs were and turned and waved at her and smiled. And it's this amazing, enigmatic it almost looks like a hologram, but it's not. It's actually the uh, etheric and astral energy being electronically teleported out of that orb. And you can see the orb is to the left over by a bush that lights up a bush, and there's a cone of light that lights up the chairs, and he's sort of being held in this energy field. And this is in the photograph. And what I point out to people is that they can be around us, and – the only thing we saw with our physical eyes was the sphere. But within the sphere of light was the entire spacecraft and all its occupants. This is the key point. But all that could be seen in this dimension as it sort of folded in was this grapefruit-sized sphere. And then we heard the sound of – many people heard the sound of these beings talking. 
and then she took the photograph. So this kind of contact experience is astonishing. Now, a lot of people say, well, why don't they just fully materialize? Well, they have done that, and, of course, it would be very brief, and then within – Usually within one or two minutes, there's a jet fighter that comes in over us. Actually, uh, two years ago when we were in England, we're getting ready to go to the crop circles um, in a couple weeks. Um, we were up on this hill in England, and we had one of these massive spheres appear, and everyone saw it. And within moments, there was a helicopter with no lights on, and I mean completely <laughs> blackened, which is against the law in any country. It had no uh, uh, navigation lights, no no lights. But it, that came over us less than 100 feet, 50 to 100 feet over us, and did this several times because it had picked up. So what I tell people is that the actual ET civilizations are very eager to make contact, but it may happen enigmatically and in ways that you don't expect. Now, people look at a lot of science fiction movies, and they need to realize that the real ET a phenomenon is something much more nuanced and amazing, actually, and conscious, um, and that it's not happening within the vacuum of a, a world that's completely healed. It's happening within the reality of Earth in 2013, which is, of course, a very heavily armed camp. So all that has to get factored into it, but the key to having a successful, deeply spiritual contact experience in however way it manifests is understanding the nature uh, and the sp true spiritual nature of, of the mind and conscious being within all of us. And when a group does it, it becomes very powerful because um, the studies that have been done uh, in consciousness studies is that when you have, say, one person intending with their awareness to affect uh, a random number generator or something, it has a certain effect. But if you have two people who love each other, where there's a heart connection, like you're talking about, Hillary, the effect is actually exponentially greater, not just arithmetically greater. And so there's this effect that is beyond space-time linearity that's very powerful when more than one person is doing this with a pure heart in a peaceful way with the right ethical intentions. And it has an amazing effect. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and, I, and that's why I've been spending so much time and energy talking about that, writing about it, sharing that message, um, because it's very important for people to understand that you know, love, love is an energy, it's an emotion, it's a, it's you know, you're, when you move into the heart, literally, you know, and, and you as a doctor know this that the heart itself creates its own electromagnetic field that is, right. it, it can be, it's actually measured more so than the brain. And um, when you actually focus your consciousness on that particular part of the body, it opens up a tremendous amount of force. And when you're doing that in a state of love, in a state of, of union, you know, with another person, it really, you know, everybody talks about the the the, <laughs> the feeling of being in love. Well, yeah, it, it changes your perspective. It changes the way you see things. It changes how you relate to things. Well, when you move into that state and you're focusing it much like a lucid dream or when you're remote viewing something, you can actually channel that energy into very profound things. And when you have a group that's doing that, it, it, you know, it, it's very, very impactful. When you were talking about the orbs though, and, and you made a really good point about how this technology and why don't they just manifest and how come they're not just showing up in our front yard and saying, hey, we're here, and the helicopter coming over. And I think what people need to realize is that the advances in technology are so way beyond what we have awareness or, or even <laughs> factual information of that the radar systems that are on this planet right now are so advanced that they really just can pick up any kind of the real they really are aware of what's going on. Oh yes. And so yeah. yeah, I mean and you of course you and your listeners know that all too well, but you know, for people who are new to the topic or new to the subject, that is a very common question that gets asked and immediately everything is debunked because that's not happening. But when you realize that the ET UFO subculture topic itself cannot just revolve around specific things, you really have to go into all kinds of things, politics, countries, uh, you know, systems, industrial complexes. You really have to start to explore those things to understand how the entire picture forms in order to get a better picture of what's really happening. Well, the other thing is that most people don't understand that 
um, whatever you may hear about on CNN that, say, the NSA has or um, the intelligence community has is usually between 20 and 50 years older than what's actually operating in what are called unacknowledged special access projects, which we go into in the film Sirius. And uh, those of you, by the way, who don't have it, you can now, it's in stock. You can get it in both NTSC and PAL. You can order it at SiriusDisclosure.com. But I think you can also see it online on video on demand there. But I think that most people don't understand, for example, that in 1974, a man that I knew personally who's since passed away, he had an electronics company, and he had invented very high-end electronics um, that would pick up what he called neutrino light, but very subtle light, almost on the level of the astral. And the National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO, Google it, it's the super-secret spy agency that runs all the classified satellites, seized the technology. He told me this personally, and I have a witness to this, by the way. They seized the technology, and this is 40 years ago, and put it on their satellite so that they could pick up ET craft even when they weren't in this dimension but were about to materialize so that they could lock on to them. So that was – now, you can imagine how many iterations of – technological evolution have happened since 1974. It's almost 40 years um, in a classified project that has, as Donald Rumsfeld said, $2.3 trillion that is unaccounted for uh, in the Department of Defense um, alone, not to mention the intelligence community, that have gone into these so-called black projects. So what I always tell people, whatever you think um, the capabilities are within classified human projects, it's a thousand times more developed. However, one of the things that they cannot do anything about is people coming together openly doing disclosure and also making contact and consciousness because, yes, I'm one person that can be a high-value target. I hate to use that term. But, you know, there are 7 billion people on the planet, and now there are thousands of teams out there doing the CE5 contact protocols and uh, many more thousands of people who are just by themselves doing it. That they can't handle. And so one of the things I tell people is that even from that point of view, looking at morphogenic field analysis uh, from Rupert Sheldrake and others, looking at non-local consciousness, looking at how change happens, whether it was the civil rights era, whether it was the uh, women's suffrage movement, whether it was the emergence of democracies around the world, whether it was the, you know, the, what you, the Arab Spring, uh, whether it was a Stonewall and the evolution of rights for gay and lesbian people, whether it, it all is about people coming together, making that change happen. Well, the big change that's, that we have to make happen is the evolution of our planet from a world of division to a world of peace and oneness where we join then and link up to all these other civilizations that are out there in the cosmos. And my understanding is that in the next few hundred years, the Earth and, and humanity is going to be completely uh, integrated and will become in a state of, of universal oneness with all these other civilizations, but openly. And that has to start somewhere. It doesn't happen instantly, but it has to start somewhere. And so that's what's really happening with the CE5 initiative and with what we're doing with disclosure and um, and contact. And the foundation of it, however, is not only the, the operational paradigm, is the understanding and practice of mindfulness and consciousness and pure-heartedness and intent. But the philosophical underpinning is also that, because once you understand that, I mean, look how different uh, someone from China is from an Italian or, you know, someone in the Congo may be from a Norwegian. Well, now multiply that a million-fold in diversity throughout the cosmos. But what is common amongst all these intelligences? The, the, it's the capacity to be sentient, to be awake, to be conscious, to be a spiritual being. That is universal. And that's why I keep coming back to this very... We're on the World Puja Network, so I'll talk about this, the whole Sanskrit concept of the oneness of mind and this unbounded absolute field of pure consciousness that is the root foundation of not only 
operationally being able to make contact and remote view in terms of practice, but in terms of understanding other cultures, because then the multiplicity is there. It's not like multiplicity and diversity is going to go away. It's wonderful, but it's not something that becomes a point of conflict. It becomes a point of celebration because you see the commonality. There's this oneness that is a thread, a golden thread that weaves all life together, and that is the state of mind, of spirituality, of this pure state of of consciousness that is really oneness, and the highest expression of love is oneness because if you love someone you want to be one with them you want to be with them so there is there are all these deep meanings to to what we're doing in contact that, that then expresses itself into what we're doing uh, socially culturally and otherwise and technologically one of the the interesting points um that I'm going to be making to this group of world leaders and I'm meeting with them is going to be the technologies that we have today to provide the deep energy that we run on are all explosive, violent technologies. Burning coal, burning oil, explosive jet engines. If you doubt it, look at the aircraft that crashed at San Francisco International Airport Saturday. Um, look at the town in Quebec that's been Im- uh, immolated, just burned up by those petroleum cars crashing into it the other night in Quebec. Um, it's an explo- And even nuclear power is very destructive. So the consciousness of the Kali Yuga of division and separation is manifested even through our technology. Whereas the technologies that are based on zero point energy and quantum vacuum is this state of oneness and it's nonviolent. It's it's like nonviolent change in the civil rights era. It's nonviolent energy generation so that you're not destroying the atmosphere you're not destroying the rivers and the land in order to generate energy and of course these uh, technologies began to be discovered uh, back in the 1800s and early 1900s they've just have been ruthlessly suppressed because of, of, of big money power issues but it is an expression of our consciousness that we still have oil and gas and coal and nuclear power and so in reality Yes, it's a technological and it's a physical thing, but it's an outward expression of our state collectively on a spiritual level. And uh, many people aren't comfortable when they hear that because nobody wants to really own that collectively, but it's just the truth. And as soon as we awaken, we can decide, oh, well, we can support a project to bring out the kinds of technologies that have been around that have been confiscated by a very small number of people um, who, who have abuse their power but if enough people get behind the idea that we can change that it will change now it may not be instant but it, it will happen but we have to intend it but we have to intend it from a place of a higher consciousness you know you make a good point and when people don't like to hear the fact that it's a mirror well, it's because they don't want to take responsibility, and it means that they then have to take responsibility and that they then have to change some of the things that they're doing. Right. And, you know, when people want change, they want other people to change. They don't necessarily want themselves to change. So we're really talking about a revolution of consciousness, and I think that's what you're seeing happen around the planet as you watch what's going on in Egypt, as you watch – you know, some of the changes that are going on in other countries. I mean, we really aren't exposed to that because of the control and the mainstream media and because of the things we're not really exposed to. And the alternative media is great, except what I find disturbing at this point is, is kind of, you know, where, where it gets confusing. And we need to remember that it's all about working together and it's about coming together to be able to meeting of the minds and, and hearts and be able to fuse that together so that we can really be a powerful unit together and come out and help these people understand that consciousness is, is not just, a, a you know, an airy-fairy kind of new agey term. It's something that's been around for a very long time. It's an ancient thing. One of the things that really uh, got me when I first started, in fact, going to the event with you at Mount Shasta is what really made me come out as a radio host. I'd been on the air for several years prior to that and start to interview people in, in the subculture and get into it and really come out publicly to start talking about my own experiences when I was a child and so on and so forth. Um, 
one of the things I noticed was that a lot of people don't like to go beyond Roswell. You know, you hear Roswell, and they don't want to <laughs> right. go any further than that. Right. It all started with Roswell. <laughs> well, you know, I hate to break it to you guys, but, you know, and that, uh, certainly I'm not addressing you, Stephen, but the thing is is that the indigenous have, have had these access to star beings, as they call them, uh, for eons way before Roswell even happened. So, oh, my God, for thousands and thousands, maybe millions. I actually yeah. believe millions a year. Oh, yeah, I actually believe millions. At the beginning. And they they have they have the records, they have it they they have they have been keepers of it guardians of it, and so when you start talking about these ancient cultures around the world that have these records and you start to bring the awareness back to that, you start to get out of a very interesting state of mind and into an even more profound blissful state of mind because the way that the records have been held by these indigenous cultures have been. Um, held very, very in, with a lot of integrity and very honest and uh, very pure and in story. And so, when you go through the, the myths and stories of, of different indigenous cultures, you will find what you're looking for if you have the time to do it. And if you actually take the next step and become involved and go out and, and get involved with these cultures and work and study with them, um, it, it's really amazing what you can be exposed to. I had this wonderful, and I, I just want to address one thing, too, before we run out of time. When we were talking about orbs and dreams and how this is one of the major contact experiences now because of the situation of the planet and how these technologies have limited the experience of being able to make actual contact. Um, you know, I had a dream recently of, of an orb, and, you you know, I reached out and touched the orb, and the orb turned into a map, and the map showed me an area of the world around Turkey. And, you know, and as I woke up the next day and, and you know, tracked it and made my notes and, and did my own research into where I needed to go and what I needed to look at, I thought about how few people take their dreams seriously and right. how they even remember them. And how, So I think what we're being asked to also is elaborate that sense of higher consciousness into our dream state as well. And so learning how to dream, taking that dream state more seriously, uh, writing it down, sharing it, creatively researching the things that show up, you will find a very, very fascinating track show up in your life. And then you'll realize that other people have the same experiences and you can share information and you can actually – uh, grow and create off of that information together. Absolutely, and and that's one of the things that when we do our expeditions um, for uh, the CE5 contact programs, we, you know, I tell people you're basically in a 24-hour training program because even at night I encourage people to keep a dream journal and to intend to be awake within the dream and to learn and to see. And it does carry over some of the most amazing experiences uh, that the group will have will be in the lucid dream state. And it's something that most people say, oh, well, I go to sleep and it's just nothing there. But in reality, most cultures have acknowledged the profound nature of what can happen in the awake lucid dream and that you can actually become aware of things while you're in the dream and begin to uh, travel and learn and explore even in that state, just like you can in the meditative state. So it becomes a seamless understanding that consciousness and, and your own conscious reality is plugged into this unbounded aspect of mind and the exploration is infinite. Uh, and we basically limit ourselves. I tell people we put ourselves in our own cages and lock it. We have the key to unlock it, and we have to intend to do it. Um, anything someone like you and I can do is sort of point the way, but ultimately every individual has the key to unlocking the freedom within their own soul. And that's what everyone has to, to accept responsibility for. And then come together together. This is where the, that individual becomes the social and cultural to make the change real in the material world where the, the, the physical world is benefited from that realization and where you get the courage, spiritual courage, to make the change happen uh, in a nonviolent way but in a way that is a spiritually the, the, the Shambhala warrior sort of way where you're not – a warrior in the violent sense, but you're not going to be intimidated by uh, people who want to drag the world back into a period of division, separation, and warfare. And I think going forward, this is one of the biggest challenges we're going to have because it's very, very easy to play on people's fears and hatreds. And this is, of course, demagogues have always done that in organized religion and political systems. Um, and the big risk of the coming decade or so 
is as people become more and more aware that there's intelligent life out there, that we not take, uh, you know, one racial or tribal or national competition and division or uh, all the different things that have divided humanity over the thousands of years of this uh, era of, of division and separation, that we not then extrapolate that into this new era of enlightenment where we then say, oh, well, now we, gotta ha- we have to view these other civilizations in an us versus them way. Because this is not progress to go from international war and intertribal war and inter species to, to then go to interplanetary war. And uh, I was just talking to Carol Rosen, who had worked with uh, Werner von Braun this week, and, and, and she and I were talking about this, that it's it's very easy to play on that proclivity within the human cultural social construct because that's been the collective experience for so long uh, in our society of you know one tribe or one religion or one nationality or one economic philosophy uh, competing with another and it, it, to the point of it being violent warfare. And so there are people who, of course, would benefit from that kind of conflict being expanded into space. And um, they are very good at manipulating that scenario. And what we have to do is say there's another path when we have to choose the path of universal peace. And that is something, it is a conscious choice we have to make. Well, it's a beautiful vision, and I certainly lend my energy to it and my love to it because, you know, we have to we have to start someplace. And everybody listening to this show can can get off the show after listening to it for the hour, and we can make a choice to go out and continue that. I know after you know you and I conversate or we do a show together, it's it always I always feel uplifted afterwards. And I want to go out and I want to you know I'll meditate out outside or go out some go for a walk or something, and it's just. I want to continue that experience, and I think that that's what we're being asked to learn how to do, is to feel that moment of uplift and then to continue that experience so that we can then move on and spread it and then lift somebody else and keep inspiring and keep musing on this higher vibrational love energy that, you know, and then make it real. I mean, ground it and really not just talk about it, but do something about it. Correct. You know, I think that's where a lot of the missing key is with the New Age movement. They have all these wonderful, great energies to them, and they talk about all this stuff, but you have to do something with it. You have to act. You have to manifest it. You have to bring it back down into this dimension because we are here, and this is what we're here to do. Exactly. Well, why don't you let people know how how folks can... Uh, get in touch with you or listen to your show. What's your site, website, and all that? Sure. Um, You can listen to me every Thursday night. I'm a a weekly show on Achieve Radio, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern. You can go to AchieveRadio.com. I'm on there. You can also go to my website, Hillary Ramo, R-A-I-M-O, Dot com. You can find all the information there. I do private phone sessions for people. Um, I work with clients all over the world. Um, you can do a Skype session if you don't live in the United States where I am. Um, you can also contact me through my website. That's really the best place to find me. You can also keep up with what I'm doing on my blog, The Yin Factor, Y-I-N Factor. And uh, that's pretty much the best place to do it. Oh, excellent. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank you, Hillary, uh, for uh, you know sharing your ideas and experiences and insights into this wonderful subject with everyone. And uh, hope I can see you again soon. It was wonderful seeing you at the uh, premiere of Sirius in Los Angeles, and I hope I can meet, meet you again very soon. Well, thanks for having me, Stephen, and I certainly hope so. All right, and to the folks at the World Puja Network, thank you for hosting us. And to everyone out there, go to our site, SeriousDisclosure.com, if you're interested in coming to the Sirius premiere in Las Vegas uh, or to the Joshua Tree a night uh, contact experience out under the stars uh, that we're having in August. All that information is there, and I hope to see all of you soon. So keep looking up, and God bless.